Okay, one of the things that we developed to help evaluate safety programs are uh, 30 key performance indicators. And I'm not gonna go through all 30 of those today and that kind of thing, it gets a little long, boring, boring and drawn out, right? But I'm gonna give you some highlights. Because if you look at these key performance indicators in your organization, you can do a little bit of a mental check and check off, hey, we're doing that well or that's somewhere to work. Okay, so I'm giving you some of the highlights here. Management, purpose, mission, vision. I don't think I need to say any more on that. Really key to get a good, um, ingrained view in your workforce of what you expect, all right? Communication, very critical. Over-communicate about safety. Over-communicate about quality and over-communicate about production. Do all three. Because here's what I see a lot is, right? We communicate with our employees about production concerns. Your employees will already do that. Can I just tell you, I mean, you tell them to be safe more often than production, they'll get you safe production. They know they gotta hit the numbers, right? If you've got people that aren't hitting their numbers, they're not gonna do it whether you implement safety or not, you probably need to move them out, right? Send them over to the other contracting firm, okay? Get the people that'll hit their numbers, but then make them do it safe. We see this in every industry. I could bore you with examples from all over the place of I'm talking to a business owner, gotta just make them do it safe. Trust me, make them do it safe. Your numbers, they're gonna go like this a little bit and then they're gonna go back up and they'll keep going, but it'll be safe. Every case, every time, always happens. Same way, okay? So over communicate about safety. So organizational structure, make sure you don't have an organizational structure that's frustrating your staff. Make sure it's clear who they report to, what's, what the line of communication is, how they're supposed to communicate with people and so on, all right? Got to have a good org structure. New hire process, very critical for bringing people in, making sure that they know what the culture is, but also making sure that you're doing things like post-offer drug and alcohol screening, okay? Substance abuse policy. Um, Ryan companies, Ryan Midwest, many of you probably know who they are, big earth moving company. They came out of Minneapolis, I think is where they got their start. Um, many years ago, I was at a safety awards banquet for them. Uh, one of their safety directors got up and he shared some crazy statistics. He says, we drug test everybody that comes onto our sites to come to work for us. That time they were uh, self-performing um, uh, late in the labor trades or a couple different trades that were self-performing. So you'd show up at their trailer, they'd say, okay, we wanna hire you. You can fog a mirror and you apparently know how to labor, so we're gonna hire you. Go down to the drug and out, or go down to the clinic and take a drug test. <laughs> 60 to 70% of the applicants that they hired, pre-hire, and then sent for a post-offer drug test did not show up at the clinic. Let that sink in for a minute. 60 to 70%. That's 60 to 70% of the employees they were about to hire that would have been doing drugs on their job. That's a staggering number, right? The more staggering number were the goofballs that did show up and tested positive, <laughs> right? It's like, you gotta be kidding, people actually do that, and they do, right? So those people are not working on their job site. Maybe they're working on yours, or maybe they're on yours, or maybe yours. Do you drug test? If you're not, do you understand as more contractors drug test, what you're dipping into at the union hall that barrel you dip into and okay, give me those four, and give me another four, right? As that bucket gets sifted through and cleaned out by good contractors, they've got the good guys, what's left in the bucket? Fortune 500 companies started drug testing many years ago. Those employees didn't, leave, didn't stop doing drugs, they just left and they ended up, a lot of them, in the trades and now we're sifting through them. So the longer it takes you to get on that bandwagon, and if that's not enough, NCCI, the National Council on Compensation Insurance, are the ones that set your EMR every year. NCCI has done studies and they tie 30 to 50% of all work-related accidents back to drug or alcohol use. We're all trying to reduce our EMR, right? I mean, who's kidding who? The bottom line, it's work comp for us in the trades, right? 
We're all trying to get that number down. I just told you that by drug testing, this is a $40 drug test. Oh, it slows them down. I gotta get them on the job. Get them on the job and they're drunk or on drugs and they fall off a building. Tell me how slow you're gonna be. You gotta do this. This is $40 to drug test an employee, right? That could save you 30 to 50% on your work comp. Tell me why you wouldn't do that. Well, I'm a union contractor. I got a collective bargaining agreement. Show me a CBA that doesn't allow post offer or doesn't allow um, reasonable suspicion or post accident testing. Many of them disallow random testing. And I get it. They don't want people being singled out. I understand that. Random testing is not all that effective anyway. What's effective is the post offer, right? Figure out how to do that. Talk to your labor attorneys and figure out how to test them and clean that situation up, okay? Subcontractor management. Uh, pardon me, I think I skipped return to work. Return to work programs, very valuable. You got the guy sitting at home with his leg up watching Oprah. Watch the commercials through those programs sometime. They're all attorneys, trial lawyers. Any trial lawyers in the room? <laughs> okay, anyway, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Anyway, moving on. So you don't want your injured employees meeting trial lawyers was the, the essence of that message. Okay. Subcontractor management. Many of you hire subs. Have you ever heard of the multi-employer worksite policy with OSHA? If you have subcontractors misbehaving on your job site and you're the GC to them or the prime to them, you will hear about that if OSHA stops by and sees them doing things wrong. Because not only will they get cited, you'll get cited. Okay? Got to control safety on your job. That's why it's also very important that as a subcontractor on your job site, so you perform well so your GC doesn't get cited. Because if you're the reason the GC gets cited and is now open to repeats, they may not want to have you back next time. They may say, eh, thank you for your bid, but no thank you. Right? So have a good relationship with your GCs by being a good subcontractor, but also making sure you manage yours well. Workstation design, work cell design. If you're doing stuff, make ready in your shops. Make sure that's all like well designed and thought through. You know, a lot of this bending and stooping kind of work and heavy lifting. I hear, you know, old timers say all the time, well, you're kidding, man. We were back in the trades. We'd lift 7,000 pounds and put it on our head and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? You're telling me we can't have men work anymore? No, what I'm telling you is that men that are working today and women that are working today, when they get hurt, they sue. <laughs> back then, we just got back up and went back to work again, right? But nowadays, you've really got to be careful of this. So make sure that you're looking through things like workstation design. It can save you a lot of money. Soft tissue injury prevention. We all have aging workforces. This is a big deal, right? We're finding workers that warm up at the beginning of the day do better in their work. They have a better function. They're more productive. They have a better quality of life. There are programs out there. There are GCs that are making your staff warm up and they're doing static stretching. Not so good, okay? Static stretching programs like many of us were taught in high school, you know, Foot over foot, reach your toe, you know, touch your toes now, you're stretching out the back of your legs and all that. All that's done cold. There's no blood flow in the, in the muscle tissue or the connecting tissue. They're subject to tearing. You stretch those muscles and they're then less active or less able to perform for the next couple of hours. You watch pro sports now, you don't see a lot of that. You're seeing guys doing dynamic warm up, lunges, uh, things where they're running in place or, or doing different activities that mimic the work they're going to do. So we've developed programs where workers can do that in 10 minutes, pre-shift, at lunch. And they do it all standing position. It's all been done by a board-certified chiropractic uh, professor. There are programs out there to help you dynamically warm up your staff. I know that's really controversial, right? having people do exercises. Anybody remember the old Michael Keaton movie, Gung Ho, where the Japanese company takes over the American car manufacturer and they'd have him doing calisthenics? There's the guy with, you know, with the, <laughs> the big gut and trying to do calisthenics, and I mean, it was just comical, right? But um, 
you know, there's a lot to be said for it. So, all right, um, soft tissue injury. So we talked about that training. So we've talked about the different uh, buckets of training. You can think through that. Am I doing those training uh, processes that we talked about? God bless you. Um, am I doing them well? Are they effective? Am I actually teaching my people? Am I investing in them and pouring money into them, pouring time into them? Hazard assessments, what we're talking about there is job site inspection. So OSHA requires that you do frequent and regular inspection of your job sites. That's the way OSHA terms it. Thank you very much, OSHA, for being so descript. What does that mean, right? Well, if I have one guy in a room with a paint roller going like this all day, I could probably inspect him once a month, right? Because there's not a lot of hazards there, right? But if I've got 12 guys hanging off of a water tower somewhere, I might want to be inspecting them daily. Right? or making sure their foreman is, or you know, that we're looking over their scaffolding and their, their lines and all that kind of thing. All right, so you get the idea. So you gotta do frequent and regular inspections. Make sure that the people that are doing those are trained. Um, okay, so with a room full of contractors, this should be kind of funny. What, what do you call the best guy on the crew? Supervisor, foreman, right? What do you call the best foreman in the company? Superintendent, right? What do you call the best superintendent? Well, he's the owner of the next contracting firm, right? This is just kind of how we work in the trades, right? We kind of grow up in the business and, hey, I, I can do what you're doing and make money at it, so I'm going to open my own thing, right? And that's how a lot of companies are started, right? So that same methodology, you know, well, we got a guy that seems to care about safety on that crew. We'll, we'll make him the safety inspector, right? And what training are we going to give him? Well, have him do an online 10-hour course. With an online 10-hour course, is he ready to do safety inspections and really find things that are going to hurt people? Probably not, right? We need to invest and get people up to speed. If we're going to ask them to do something, train them. You wouldn't put a guy in your business as your estimator if he didn't know about your business and doing takeoffs and scale on drawings and those kind of things, right? You want to make sure they're trained. So same thing applies here. Incentive programs, a lot can be said here. But I will just tell you that OSHA is very hot on this topic. If you have incentive programs that incent our crew for not having any accidents this month, we get a free t-shirt if we don't have one, or we get hats, or we get pizza, or we get 50 bucks, or we get $1,000, whatever it is, all the way from the t-shirt to the $1,000, you are incenting us that when Dan here hits his hand with a hammer, we're all gonna go whoosh. Just put some, you know, wrap that up with something, toilet paper, whatever, don't say anything to anybody about it because we're all gonna lose our pizza, Dan, and that's really important. OSHA knows that that kind of thing happens. That sounds like a crazy example. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen project managers for very large projects for very large companies. You'd be amazed if I told you who this was. Um, so, no, yeah, I will not, thank you. <laughs> um, I have seen them suppress, they, we had a guy got stung by a bee, and because that would be an OSHA recordable, if you had to send him to the clinic, he didn't want us to send him. The guy was in the car having a reaction, and he didn't want us to, he was like stopping us from calling 911. Finally went, dude, I'm calling him. And you know, you can deal with your bonus later. But because he had a recordable, he was gonna lose his bonus. That's the kind of thing that happens. You know, drive him off the lot, let him die out there, he got stung. That kind of mentality, right? It sounds barbaric. These programs can create that kind of reality. So be careful with them. Uh, disincentive programs, you definitely want to disincent your employees from doing the wrong thing, right? So if you're gonna do incentive programs, base them on, are you doing your toolbox talks effectively? Or do you, are you doing them every Monday morning and on time and so on, all right? Um, but disincent them when they violate safety procedures. It's very important. If you have kids, you understand the concept of a disincentive. When your children were young and small and they went running towards the street, you stopped them. Right? I hope. Right? You stopped them. Okay? So now when you have construction workers working on your site, why do we all go, I don't want to write the guy up, he won't be my friend anymore, but he's working right next to the edge of a 700 foot fall, improperly tied off. 
I, I mean, get a clue, right? If the guy falls, who's responsible? Yeah, well, <laughs> you wouldn't have to worry about the friend part, right? But you're responsible for his death. I don't want to be too heavy there, but I mean, that literally is the, the we got to adopt that mindset. I got to break through the confrontation dislike barrier to make sure that you're going to go home at the end of the day. Okay?